moment, our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your host. Jeff Nerfherder Chandler, Jim Kaiju Baker, and Christina Yojimbo Henry. You can continue. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. Better to lay that out there. As soon as I, oh, and you know what? You know what I've been yet. doing in the past week, watching um, the other two told Matrix you not movies. To watch them. <laughs> no, told see, I had every intention as well them. to watch the second and the third because I had uh, no intentions of watching the second and third movies. Well, that's uh, that's very <laughs> apparent now. You had no intentions of watching the new one either. <laughs> I, I mean, if you guys didn't make me, I wasn't going to watch it. So when you were like, "We're not going to do it," I was like, "You like <laughs> Look at that! I had never seen part three. Like I did just thought I had seen it and I had no memory of no, it, no, but no. I had never even watched it to begin with. It was completely <laughs> foreign. It was actually, I, I enjoyed part three. I thought it was pretty good because it was all about the siege on Zion. So it was yeah. like a war movie. So it was yeah, pretty I remember good. That. But I also remember that we only watched it one time, you know, on DVD. Like when it first, we didn't go see it in the theater. We just were like, let's finish mm-hmm. it off. And we watched it. And we were were like, we're like, so this is a war movie? Like, mm-hmm. what yeah. what's going on here? It just felt so different from the other. At the time it came out, I liked the first one. Oh, and, absolutely. But when I rewatched it recently, I was like, this isn't that great. I well, just, we, we yeah. Jim and I, I, it wasn't the three of us. I, it was just the two of us. I wasn't that reviewed there. That? Okay. I was sick. Yeah. So again, I think we felt the same way, which was at the time, seeing it in the theater, it was so revolutionary. But now it's been so watered down over the years because everyone has emulated it and it doesn't have the same bite as it did. Yeah, I wanted to watch the other two because I I've, I saw the second and third in the theater and that was it. I, I've mm-hmm. never gone back and rewatched them. I was so disappointed with them. I think that for me, too, going back to the original film, when it came out, I wasn't as familiar with all the films that influenced it. And I watch a lot more of those films in intervening years so that yeah. also distills it a lot for me too but yeah but mostly i think my frustration just boils down to the fact that trinity just becomes a nothing character over the course of <clears throat> just the first film where she goes from this really badass powerful character yeah, who's just like who's just like neo's cheerleader at the end like you can do it that's what i'm here for to tell <laughs> well, you he you is, can do he it was, he was the chosen one What angered me when initially viewing part two, you know, it brought back all those feelings, this stupid (laughs) rave. And I'm like, so wait a second, all these people in Zion all look like supermodels and they all oil themselves up and they come out for the rave. It was ridiculous. It was completely ridiculous. I had an argument with someone the other day about whether or not you would take the red pill or the blue pill. And I said, absolutely. I would stay in the freaking matrix because the reality when they break out looks horrible. (laughs) Just go back, you know, just what tank says. I I know it's a fake steak, but it still tastes damn yummy. Put me in there. Yeah. I I did want the entire series to play out and then they just pan back and you realize that they're all still in the matrix. They just thought that they broke out. I um, am just very thrilled right now that I don't have to watch the new one. So So anybody listening, welcome, (laughs) because I'm assuming we're in at this point. (laughs) You're not reviewing the matrix. (laughs) (laughs) It was on the schedule. I screwed it up and Christina's thrilled. I am. I'm so thrilled beyond will, belief. We will not be. We will not be watching. And I this. am thrilled beyond be belief this. because it's been three weeks since Spider Man has been out, and I can finally talk to somebody about I it. I can't. I can't because I saw it three that. weeks ago. I know. I can't believe that you've been sitting on this. Even last week, well, two weeks ago when we were recording, you're like, "We got two more episodes to get through before we can even bring up Spider Man." I didn't see it until last Friday. I saw it the Thursday before Christmas. 
I've seen it it twice now. I'm fully prepared to speak on Spider-Man. Well, well, I know you've had three weeks to think about this. I've had probably almost a solid two weeks, and I still don't know what to make of it. And those listeners, thank you, by the way, for tuning in. Yes, and Happy New Year, 2022, uh, the year of our Lord and Savior, and also, I should mention, the year of Soylent Green. Mm -hmm. So, welcome. (laughs) And it kind of feels like we're right there, doesn't it? Yeah, no, yeah. (laughs) Economic disparity, the earth is warming. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, not too far off. I hope in reality they take the sheets off the bodies before they grind them up and make them into soylent green because well, I don't want to be you eating fiber. Well, yeah, you get your oh, yeah, you too, get your right? fiber. You get your fiber. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. Egyptian cotton never so, tasted so good. But we were in the middle of a Matrix conversation. So we are not covering the Matrix for all you fans. And apparently, not a lot of you have seen it because it's not doing as well compared to the juggernaut that is spider-man but well, is that also because it's available on hbo max and people, it could it, be it could be diluting be because i'll tell you i had every intention of going to the theater to see it and the minute i realized that ben was home and i had access to his hbo max i'm like i'll just watch at home because hmm. all three of them are on there oh well all four now all four of them now right because I had every intention of going back and watching this. So, but I did. So now I'm going to have to watch the fourth now just because I to. put in the time for two and three. Can you but, just give us your review next week? Well, maybe if I actually okay. take the time and watch it. But <laughs> what I wanted to say for this episode was not only did I, I did a lot of homework for this, for the, these next two episodes, one of which we're not going to do. Not only did I watch <laughs> the Matrix movies, I watched every single Spider-Man movie going into wow. Spider-Man No Way Home. Wow. After That's my first your- viewing, because the reason being is that my son only knows the Tom Holland Spider-Man oh. movies. So I saw Spider-Man No Way Home by myself the first time, opening day, because I did not want to get spoiled because I'm on our Twitter all the time and I'm going to yeah, see something sure. invariably, even by accident. So I saw it. First day, first showing, so I wouldn't get spoiled. And then two weeks later, I brought my family. But in those intervening two weeks, we went through all three Toby movies and then the two Andrew Garfield movies. So That's he would know everybody move. That is and a good everything. Move right there. Look at you. And he was like, why are we watching? You know, because every night it was a different Spider-Man yeah. movie. I'm What's like, going eh, on, Dad? Yep, you it's, doing? you know, Christmas family viewing, I think I said. But <laughs> without actually spoiling to anybody that these people are going to be in the movie that we're up. seeing in two weeks. Well, yeah. Listen, I, I hate to tell you, if you saw the trailer and I know you don't watch it. I no. didn't. I didn't watch Everything the trailer. I closed my this, eyes. There is not a single thing in this movie that happens. It's a surprise. Everything they even showed Toby out. and Andrew in no, the trailer. That was that was spoiled months ago online. It was and it wasn't because Andrew himself denied, deny, deny. That was which, his... which means that 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 he was in it. There was it nothing. There was nothing. I under, right under contract. Under, <laughs> it has to deny it. your agreements. And I actually but, read an article. I forget who it was. Collider or comic book geek or whatever. One of these comic book websites. And they were like, well, we're a little disappointed with Andrew. He lied to us. I'm like, right. like Christina just said, what is he right. supposed to say? Molina came out and he's like, yeah, I'm in this. <laughs> he's in the trailer. Well, he, he is in the trailer. He, All of he them does are appear. In the trailer. He does yeah. appear in like the first 10, 15 minutes. No, but no, but, but, but he confirmed it before the trailer dropped. Oh, by the yeah. way, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> If you're listening to our review of the new Spider-Man movie, please know that there are going to be many, many, many spoilers because it's impossible to talk about Most of them have already dropped. (laughs) But there are some more that we haven't talked about yet. So yeah. We will be dissecting this. We will be tearing this apart. We will be telling you everything that happens. Yeah. We don't feel Um, that we need to champion this movie. I think it's already been in the top 10 uh, of all time. So it already broke like 1 billion. (laughs) 1 billion. As a side note, I want to mention that the trailer for the new Spider-Verse movie came out and I'm pretty darn excited for that. Yeah, this is yeah. Uh, this is basically a live action version of Into the Spider-Verse. Yes, that, that that's one of my issues with this movie. One of your issues. One of my issues. One of your like issues. I'm saying, I've, I have I, I can't tell you how many people have hounded me wanting to know my opinion. We walked out of the theater. I saw this with seven other people including my son thursday night on christmas the the thursday before christmas sold out the the theater was jam-packed my wife would have lost her freaking mind the the crowd was so into this movie and as soon as it was over ben had already seen it once and he's like so dad and i'm like 
I don't know yet. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know? And you he see, was mad at me that, that I really had to think about this and contemplate. I, I will tell you that I was the exact same way when I first saw it. And my opinion changed completely the second time. The, second time, yeah. the main help with that being seeing all five yeah. other movies before seeing it the second time. I watched it in a completely new light. I did not rewatch all the other films right no. beforehand, but I will say that I still love Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. Yes. I just, I loved him so yes. much when he was the, the in the Sam Raimi films. There's something about him. He has this quality that I really love on screen. It's particularly strong in Pleasantville, if you've ever seen. Oh, yes. One yes. of my favorite That films. is a movie yep. we really need to talk about and at some point. I he has, I told my husband, I'm like, his heart is in his eyes. Yeah. And, and when I saw him, I knew he was in the movie, you know, because you just assume it has to happen because you see the villains. And even if you didn't see the spoilers online, you know that if the villains are there, the other Spider-Mans are going to be there. But still, it was like my heart grew three sizes. Oh, like, <laughs> Toby, I love you. Now, this is a yeah. reason why I lost sight. I, it's been so long since I've seen the original trilogy. And like I said, the lifetime of my son, I haven't watched these things with him. Wow. Watching them again. I had forgotten how good Tobey yes. Maguire was. Yeah. And even after the Andrew Garfield movies came out, you know, I didn't hate him. I don't think that he deserves all the, the comparisons because that's, his, that's their own thing, those two movies. But I always thought that while Andrew Garfield was a very strong Spider-Man, nobody could beat Tobey yeah. as Peter Parker. Yeah, yeah. This, goes back, this goes back to our uh, Endgame discussion, which was the fact that, Toby Maguire was a fantastic Peter Parker. Andrew Garfield was a fantastic Spider-Man. Yeah. But Tom Holland is the best of both. And I this think... movie truly made me appreciate Andrew Garfield. I feel bad that I ever. Oh, yeah. Him. The whole world, but... I think, now has a greater appreciation for Andrew yeah, Garfield. He, he absolutely just. Yeah. The, the three of these guys together just makes your heart sing. It really was fun to watch the three of them interact together. I think the problem for Andrew Garfield was that he came after Tobey Maguire. Yeah, you yeah. can't you do can't that. Help. It was bad writing too. Peter Parker was not the streetwise skateboarding punk. The, I think the major thing for me was that it just came too soon on the heels of those Tobey Maguire movies. Well, they tried right. they yeah. they tried yeah. to reboot it too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's money to be made. Sony's like, let's go. Slap someone else in that suit and mm -hmm. off we run. Mm -hmm. Look how many times Batman's been rebooted with different. We got a new one coming. All right. So uh, we're actually, we're already well into our discussion. Do we have yeah, any news before we? Yes. We have week. to mention Betty White. That is all I want to say, which is I had every intention of coming into 2022, announcing that here's this woman turning 100 years old. She is an American icon. She is loved, beloved by everyone. Which Regal made it very apparent to us that she was about to turn 100 years old because there yeah, was an ad I, for a birthday celebration before Spider-Man. TV Spider is still pushing on my Facebook thread this, this birthday celebration. And I'm like, it had to have already been in the can. I'm sure yeah, it definitely I'm, yeah, was. I'm sure it's recorded. Uh, but 17 days before her, her 100th birthday, she passed away. And uh, so, yeah, that is uh, my, my feel-good news item uh, uh, turned into a bad one because I feel like every week we just talk about someone dying. So I was all excited that, you know, let's celebrate this woman's life. And she beat mm. me to the punch. All right. Spider-Man. Yeah. No way home. Yeah, let's go. That's where are yeah. you to this? Anybody that listens to this knows that I don't watch trailers. Closed my eyes. So the end credit of this movie must have pissed you off. Oh, it did. I'm sure it yeah. pissed everybody off. So the final, final end credit. Of oh, this no, movie. there's a lot of people who are thrilled with it. But if you don't want to know anything about the next movie coming up. Face. Yeah, well, let's not talk about that yeah. until later. But <laughs> talking about the No Way Home trailer, it came on before Ghostbusters. Now, I'd avoided it online when it dropped. Yeah. You know, of course, I'm not going to go out of my way and click and watch it. So but it came up before Ghostbusters. I'm like, oh, I hear Alfred Molina's voice. I hear Willem Dafoe's voice. And I hear Dr. Strange say they're all coming through. I'm like, great. Yeah. But at least I didn't hear Toby. I didn't hear Andrew. I'm like, OK, they may or may not still be in it. Andrew's deny, deny, deny. So it could be that they're not in it. So but are you sitting there watching this movie going, when are they going to show up? When I, are they going to show up? Well, yes and no. Yeah, because See, let me talk there. about it's still been laid out there. Jeff, you said that yeah. your viewing was a packed theater, correct? Packed, jam packed. My viewing capacity. 11 a.m. in the morning on Friday, the day that it opened, 
So, you know, you go in, you choose your seats at the box office like you normally yep. do, or you do it at home before you if, you if you buy tickets online. So I sit down, I'm in my sweet spot in the theater, you know, over to the left side. So I try to stay out of the middle because I don't want to be sandwiched next notebook. to anybody. Yeah. With my pen, I know I didn't have it because I knew I was going to see it a second Ooh. time. So this was just fresh. Ooh, I was going in with no was... notebook. Wow. So I'm sitting there during the last trailer. Somebody comes and sits directly next to me. There is a row completely empty in front of me and a row half empty behind me. And this guy sits right next to me with his two kids on the other side of him. And they're sitting right next to the people that are in the middle of the aisle. So they sandwich yeah. themselves in between these two groups. They can see the seats that they're choosing at the box office. So for whatever reason, he chose to sit right next to people. I was kind of preoccupied with that. And I didn't want to make a scene <laughs> and get up because like I chose the seat. This is my seat where I always sit and I am not going to move for this guy. He's going to move before I move. Oh, there he is. So I did a little <clears throat> like, you know, maybe if oh, I cough, wow, I will scare I'm him away. That's passive aggressive right there. Look In my mess, I was you. upset. Like, You're why would you sit right next the to me? What is going on? <laughs> did you pass gas? I did not. I oh, drew I the line gone. at that, but, <laughs> but I was a little preoccupied. And so during my viewing, I was, yeah. Kind of like, let's get moving so I can get away from this guy. But during my second viewing and the theater was much more crowded, yet nobody sat right next to us, thankfully. So I was more relaxed. I had seen the other movies. So it was more of an optimal viewing the second time than it was the first time. COVID has ruined the movie yeah. experience. Altogether. Well, you know, we went on New Year's Eve. So the film had been out for like 13, 14 days at that point. And we went to the first showing of the day, which was 1045 a.m. And when I booked the tickets, you can choose your seat, same thing. Yeah. And there was nobody else who had booked a seat at the time. I was like, oh, maybe the theater won't be so crowded. And I only booked the seats like three days before. But that day, a lot of people came in. Like the theater was almost completely <clears> full. And there was somebody next to me. Although the annoying thing about that guy was he was by himself. So there's two seats on the end of our row. And he picked the one that was right next to me. And next then he put his you. backpack in the empty one next to and, it. And he couldn't have switched that. So he had right. the backpack as like, a buffer right. between. Right. That he is... could have switched it, but he sat next uh, to me. Yeah, that's see, like, that's a okay. little. Okay. Mm. Whatever. But I wore two masks. You know, yeah. I was like, it, I'm in the theater for almost three hours. Three hours, yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to double mask. And, you know, it'll be fine. Well. You know, up to this point, Regal has forced you to buy your, your seat, pick your seats, and you had a buffer. Obviously, now that there's, you know, there's money to be made, this this thing is playing in, in 20 screens at my theater over here. Uh, and my buddy Chris, who I work with, told me that he went to go buy his tickets, and Regal, the app, would not allow him to pick seats with a space in between. Mm -hmm. So they're forcing you to, to fill in that gap. But I had three teenage girls next to me who giggled and talked no oh. interest in the movie whatsoever and all three of them were on their phone at the same time so i did as jim you, you that's a little passive aggressive move i literally turned to my son and i just said out loud we chose the two worst seats in this theater and then i turned and just stared at them and it didn't deter them at all they the girl next to me was literally had her phone out the entire time. I, I think I would rather have my experience than that, because at least even though the guy was right next to me, he didn't make a sound during the, right. the movie, just the fact that he was there. But that would be even more of an annoyance. Maybe he's got his own podcast talking about <laughs> you right now. Yeah. He's like, and then there was this guy. What he actually this? told one of his kids to shut up at one point. <laughs> oh my, Dad, this is scary. me. Shut up. <laughs> my experience has been like the earlier you go, the less you tend to encounter the people with the phones. The later in the day you get, the more likely it is. Well, this was, like somebody... I said, this was a seven o'clock, you know, it was right. all There's... the kids were home for Christmas break. My theater, they were screaming at the, the, I have not been a part of a movie like this in quite some time where literally half of the theater is yelling at the other half of the theater to shut up. When Andrew Garfield shows up, a kid screams, it's Spider-Man. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's been Spider-Man from the day we opened this thing. But yeah, that's his Spider-Man, apparently. It was, it Did was he say the same thing when Toby came out? No, look, I don't that's think Spider-Man. No, because no, I don't think he knew who he was. <laughs> 
even like the reveals of the two spider Toby gets a much more dramatic reveal than Andrew Garfield does. Toby walks out of the light as if he's coming back yeah. from the dead. And when he's they- not even wearing his spider <laughs> suit and you don't need it. I'm just going to go out just like a cool youth pastor. Yes. Because I was thinking to myself, <laughs> is he so disillusioned that he refused to wear the Spider-Man suit to He's come like, back yeah, for I this movie? I still don't believe I'm in this movie. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I saw what you did to me in Spider-Man 3. We're not doing that again. <laughs> I, I was hoping that Spider-Man 3 would improve on a on this viewing. No, it did not. No. It did not. No. It's Is it better or worse than Venom? There may be carnage. I really liked Venom. There may be carnage. For $3.99 <laughs> on Amazon Prime. <laughs> So you I laughed. Enjoy. I laughed out loud several times during Venom. There may it be took me, It took me quite a few viewings to actually appreciate Venom as a buddy comedy and not the worst superhero movie ever. <laughs> uh, so, but anyways, we're not All talking right. Venom. Well, wait, so, we are talking Venom eventually. We are eventually. Um, no Way Home begins, though. You can't open this movie without tying it into the end of Far From Home. Oh, which literally completely is... upends Peter Parker's life. Who? J. Jonah Jameson exists in this reality in the MCU. I think he's more like an Alex Jones type Alex of character. Alex Jones, yeah. totally. Yeah. That's exactly the impression yeah. that I got. Like, you know. Right, uh, that, that he doesn't really belong to a network. He just has his own equipment. Like a YouTube that he's like channel. Broadcast. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is fine by me, you know. Nobody knows what a newspaper now is anyway. Well, that's so, I actually said that to my son, you know, because we were in the diner afterwards you know eating lunch talking about the movie and i was like of course he does that because an editor of a newspaper has no influence now you know in the era of cell phones and that was one of the things that really got me about this movie that scene when peter goes into the high school and all the kids are filming him walking down the hall yeah Yeah. with their cell phones you know it's exactly what would happen now absolutely you know people will be like oh that's peter parker let me put it on my tiktok (laughs) <laughs> yeah. he's the most famous person on earth during the first 10 15 minutes of this movie because everybody knows obviously now because he's been outed that he is spider-man and mysterio played himself jake gyllenhaal in the previous movie played himself as the hero that was murdered by spider-man and it, tony stark is now implicated happy is now implicated poor aunt may is implicated for child endangerment because she knew she knew about yeah. spider-man uh, MJ and Ned are accomplices to Peter and his murdering ways. So the FBI yeah. is all over him. This goes by the wayside really quick, though. This story. The other well, you that, wanted to, right? You wanted to. I don't you know. Do, yeah. But the one thing I think that's very interesting, and I don't know if this is a conscious choice, but there's a very, very big difference between Tony Stark revealing himself as Iron Man and Peter Parker being outed. It's not just the circumstances under which they were revealed. I feel like to a certain extent, you know, Tony's wealth insulates him from the consequences. Plus he also, right, he has, he's got name recognition. He's got cachet behind it. Yeah, nobody can touch Tony Stark even before he, you know, he's famous before and he becomes marginally more famous afterwards sure because he's already like you know bill gates of the the mcu right so everybody already knows who he is right but when you're just a kid who lives with his aunt in a regular apartment in new york city and you don't have billions of dollars to protect you from this harassment no but you also have a guy online accusing you of murdering right you know this this quote-unquote hero you know tony stark gets that too right especially in the second avengers film where you see you know yeah yeah. you know that he's really being held responsible for certain events they have to go hide in happy's condo he's wealthier than they are and he can protect them to a certain extent like money is a buffer in this universe the same way it is in the real world and i think that's interesting it's subtle it's sort of under the surface but it's there yeah, yeah. But, and, no. but i think that's true to peter parker's character because he's always been a schlubby nobody you know can barely you know that was the that was the one thing about these marvel comics in the 60s that they weren't superman they weren't batman who had billions of dollars at his disposal to go out and fight crime he was a kid who made together his own suit and felt responsible for his uncle's death but was more concerned about how he was going to pay the rent than how he was going to take down Electro, you know, and that, that was the drive of, of, you know, Stan Lee when he wrote all these characters and why people related to them. And I think by the end of this, and we'll get there is that that brings Holland's character back to that situation. I 
this is brilliant because up to this point, he really hasn't been Spider-Man. There was a brilliant montage in the beginning of magazine covers. And there's one Time magazine cover that shows a baby dressed as Spider-Man. And it yes. says Iron Man Junior. 2. Iron Man, Iron Man 2 or Iron Man 2. And that's really what he was, you know, he yeah, was blanketed absolutely. by Tony Stark. Yeah, because look at the technology. Spider-Man never had that technology at his disposal. Up until this point during this Tom Holland, we just assumed that he had the exact same origin as the previous two, which is Uncle Ben died. He realized he needed to do something with his life, and this is what he was going to do to no. protect people. And that's not. They, this no. was brilliant in that case that they waited until this movie to, to make give, this To give him story. angst. And the movies have had no angst from to this no, point. No. Of. Watching the first five, there is such a marked difference in tone between those first five movies. The Andrew Garfield movies are like they, they border on drama. You know, there's almost no comedy in the first Amazing Spider-Man, which was to its detriment. And they kind of started to resolve that in Amazing Spider-Man 2. But that's what really set the Tom Holland movies apart. They were so much lighter in tone than those other five movies that came before. Because Spider-Man was just miserable in all five of those movies. And that's really what he should be. They've kind of brought that into they, they, this they new one. Back. Yeah. I remember in Spider-Man 2, the, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man 2, the... I just remember him struggling so hard. He's like a pizza delivery guy. Yeah. He's not mm -hmm. showing up for his college classes. <clears throat> and he's trying so hard to be a good Spider-Man and a good, you know, good at delivering pizza and good at yeah. going to school and all this stuff. And people have this bad impression of him and they don't see that struggle yeah. that he has. And that, again, is like it's very true to life because that's what most people are doing. Right. They're yeah, struggling. And I think his They're professor struggling. actually told him he was a slacker that he, he can do. He expects better of him. He, he thinks he can do better. And he's like, mm. you know, I can't tell you what's really going on in my world, but I'm trying. Brilliant, but lazy. Right. Yeah. Yes. You know right. Said? Yeah. Yep. I think yeah. that was uh, Don't give me Kurt excuses. Connors. Kurt Connors in the original said that. Kurt Connors. Can we just talk about um, Charlie Cox for a second? How I was overjoyed to see Matt Murdock sitting in, um, in, in May's apartment and that May somehow knew him and got him over there. Matt Murdock says to Happy, you're going to need a you're going to need a really good lawyer. I'm like, but what are you? You're a really right. good lawyer. Well, I and think that's what he was implying. Yeah. <laughs> he was a really good lawyer. So I think the interesting Because thing... when he catches the brick, he says, how do you do that? He goes, I'm a really good lawyer. The interesting thing about this is, you know, that we're going to talk about Hawkeye in the second feature, mm -hmm. who also features another Daredevil character. Yeah. Or two. <laughs> and um, the thing about that was right after I'd watched Hawkeye and I hadn't watched Spider-Man yet. I read an article which basically said, you know, does this mean that Daredevil is part of the MCU canon because of the inclusion of this character in the Hawkeye show? And in the article, they pointed out that Marvel has already trolled us with Evan Peters in WandaVision. In WandaVision yeah. I think that including the Charlie Cox Mac Murdoch in the film indicates that it is yeah. part of the canon and it wasn't just like this is, know, this is a, this is this troll. is a bigger this is a bigger <laughs> issue with this whole quote unquote unleashing the multiverse and they're going to get into it even more so with this doctor strange movie which is i feel you're going to lose the casual mcu fan really quickly when you start doing this type of stuff when you start pulling in these characters from all these different tv shows because go back to hawkeye and i know we're going to talk about hawkeye on the back end but they retro a character that we've already known in agents of shield yes so and that's, if yes. that is the case then are they rewriting or not ignoring that show or is this much more like the star wars universe where favreau and filoni are are, are cherry picking certain characters and certain events in you know all the vast star wars stuff that's taken place whether it's the video game um in the in the comics or the animated series and just bringing these in and be like all right remember you saw these characters in this show but that show doesn't really exist he now exists in this universe and he might be slightly different than what you're used to because don't forget happy hogan uh john favreau actually played foggy nelson in the ben affleck Daredevil. Daredevil, yeah. But you've got all this wacky stuff going on, and I really feel that it's going to get muddy really quick. Well, this is something that I've said before. I said it fairly recently when we were talking about another Marvel thing. I forget what, but I Eternals, said... Eternals, maybe? 
that there's a problem. They are starting to get to the comic book problem now yeah. with the films, yeah. which is that at some point the comic books lose new readers, which is why they reboot the whole yeah. series every once in a while because the the series become too unwieldy. There's too yep. many crossovers. Yeah, X Men. X Men is an there's, example. Yeah, you know, sixty plus years of history. There's too yeah. much history and they can't bring in new readers. And of course you yeah. always need new readers. So every once in a while you see this massive reboot. Marvel does it. DC's done it recently twice, you know. DC fairly- is is doubling down on this whole thing because now you're starting to hear that Michael Keaton's showing up as Batman in numerous TV shows. And and to, to a certain degree, this movie is that reboot where it's, it's bringing those other two Spider-Men into this universe and you're like, we're not going to negate those. They do exist, but you know, it's, it's almost like fan service to a certain degree. Mm. Going off on what Christina is saying and what she said about the unwieldiness, look back at Star Wars, the original trilogy, that when you're watching that as a kid, you're not necessarily thinking, oh, this is going to be relevant 50 years from Correct, now right. to yeah. generations to come. A throwaway line. And yeah. so just imagine somebody dipping their toe into these movies 50 years from now and realizing they have to watch them all in order and probably have to get like an instruction booklet on how to watch them. Well, I mean, good thing you were there to actually walk your son through just this movie. Because if he had walked in not knowing who those other two Spider-Men are, I wouldn't have cared. I wouldn't have cared at all. I wouldn't. It hmm. wouldn't matter to me if the entire audience erupted because it, it means no. It means nothing to, to me. you. Nothing, yeah, nothing to me. The fact that Aunt May spews out Uncle Ben's line, it's like, oh, it's it's one of those moments as a fan. You're like, holy, they just did that. They just pulled that out from underneath me. But at the same time, it would be. I mean, it would mean nothing to anybody who has no relevance or interest. It's those three girls sitting next to me. They had no. I don't even know why they were there. But well, I mean, but this this too is and to a certain extent now Star Wars is getting like this with the TV shows where like the Mandalorian, you can enjoy it for what it is if you don't know anything else. Yes. But if yeah. you've watched the Clone Wars and you've watched Rebels and you know all the other stuff that's happened beforehand. But I think, you know, you, at a certain point, you're asking for a lot from the casual viewer. I talked yes. about that. Yeah. I think I talked about this in the context of Loki. Because my mom watched the Loki TV show and she was like, I don't get it. You know, like there was just, there was too much. She's enjoyed most of the Marvel films, but just started to get into the multiverse thing. And she was kind of like, okay, so then I'm, you know, explaining about how important Kang the Conqueror is going to be in the future. And she's like, right. Why do I care now? Yeah. And then she's like, well, I guess I have to watch it again. It's like, you don't want to have to ask again, like a 70 year old woman. No. Rewatch a whole TV show so she can figure out what's going on. She just wants to be able to go and watch a movie where like superheroes fight villains. You yeah. know, she doesn't want the weight of yeah. all these other yeah. things that have happened and, before it. And Marvel is pretty good. At, I think even with the newer movies, I think Eternals was maybe the only one where it really kind of tripped up for me bringing new people in for each movie right. like making that balance of introducing somebody that's never seen a marvel movie as to who these characters are and, and also and servicing world. the people that have watched right. every single and explaining this world thing. that we now live in but yeah i think i think the, the detriment was that uh the eternal characters were just not interesting yeah that's yeah, that's what it no, broke down no to emotional connection to him whatsoever so but, but talking about emotional connection getting back to this one and mm-hmm. Peter, the conundrum that he's in, the scene in the donut shop, the heartbreaking scene where nobody gets into MIT because they're all, you know, attached to Peter in some way. And he looks at the ugliest Halloween Dracula lights that's the bearded Dracula. And that I'm makes him think. I'm guessing those are handmade specifically. I know. Like Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange. And yeah. Doctor Strange is weird in this movie. He's strange yeah, anyway. I don't like the way he's written in this. I don't know what's going on with this. It's a, First of all, I don't like... I don't buy for a minute that Peter Parker was able to outsmart him in this mirror universe. The fact that he agreed to do the spell in the first place. He was well, very this, easily talked into it by, but by this Peter. goes back to the first Doctor Strange movie in which he's told straight up, you know, could, because at the end of the movie, he, he turns back time. And they're like, you can't you can't do this without ramifications. There are going to be you can't just play with time. So he is a little loosey goosey with this stuff. But you find out. Because he was blipped for five years that he is no longer Sorcerer Supreme. It is Wong. 
but Wong Wong, is kind of, but Wong is kind of like okay, just leave me out of it. Yeah, like, Wong. Right, he had other yeah. things to do. He had to go to Shang Chi and go play uh, karaoke. Yeah, but but Wong, at kids. the same time, Wong is trusting that he is well, going to do the think, right thing. You would you know? think that right? You can't. It's like I'm okay, you leave. are my boss. I assume that you're going to know point. what to do here. Right. But the other thing is, is that this may play into it. Is that initially, in the mouth, in the mouth of madness, multiverse, whatever it's called, was supposed to come out before Spider Man, and the movies had to be rejiggered in order to mm. to make this work for Spider Man to come out first. So something may be off with Doctor Strange here that we're not aware of. Well, yeah. Again, the the convolutedness of it all, which. You, you know, talk about this Doctor Strange trailer, you're bringing in a character from the what if, the, the animated cartoon that probably a lot of people didn't watch. Now you got to go back and watch that to know who that guy is. But you can tell Doctor Strange is a little bitter about his blip and not being the Sorcerer Supreme because he, he points be. out, it's like, on a technicality, I am not Sorcerer Supreme anymore. Peter goes to him hat in hand, asking him to turn back time so his friends can get into MIT, basically. What does he share now? <laughs> and strange is like i can't i don't have the the eye anymore it's it's gone he's like oh yeah you're right so but he's like wait a second there is that one spell we can make everybody forget they go down into the basement they start to work the spell and peter starts to ruin it in mid spell saying wait 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 a second mj should really still know who i am Ned should really still know who I am. Wait a second, Aunt May should Aunt really May. know who I am. Well, what about Happy? Otherwise, I'm not getting my Stark tech. Yep, and so Strange is getting more and more pissed off at him. Yeah, well, that's when he should have just like put hit the pause button. Yeah. So again, like you said, this is this is where it's a little out of character where he's just like willy nilly, like ah, screw it, we're gonna do this anyways. So it's almost yeah. like he, once you start casting the spell, you have to complete it. You know, that was the impression that I got. Yes, because then he had to encapsulate it in this thing. But and, but he even said, he goes, you've changed it six times already. And Peter's like, no, it was only five. And it's like, well, you would think that Doctor Strange would also have to add, include himself in there so that he doesn't forget who Peter is. You know, what's funny is that when I saw this the second time, I was almost convinced Doubting. that that line was a reference to us not getting a Sinister Six, but rather a Sinister Five. Sinister Five? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This whole scene is a little wonky, like you said. And, you know, the fact that he tells them, like, you know, again, this goes back to the whole Peter Parker not really being Peter Parker at this point or Spider-Man, because he really has Ned and MJ at his side throughout these three movies. Strange even makes it. All right. Well, Scooby do this crap. You three figure this out. I got better things to think, to do. I, I agree with you that Dr. Strange seemed off in this. But wasn't it weird how he didn't have the eye at the beginning, but then he did at the end? Did he? Did he, he? Did he oh, have the eye? Oh, what is that? I mean? don't think I picked that up either. Because some people had to be explained where the friggin' eye was to begin with. Uh, like, what? What? When he when he reemerges seeing... from where Peter trapped him from the mirror dimension? Like halfway through the movie, the pendant reappears on his chest. The eye Agamotto is the device that in cave and and that holds the time stone. That holds the time stone, but he wasn't wearing it earlier in the film. Oh, maybe so when that, he got out of uh, Grand Canyon, yeah. he went back. And, to the and you know, they, they don't do anything like that by chance. So hmm. it was just something that I noticed. I was like, oh, hey, that I didn't pick the, up on. He's got the pendant again. See now, I need a second. See now, the scriptwriter of No Way Home that's listening to this is like, damn it. <laughs> 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 but the fact that you're bringing up that Dr. Strange uh, into the mouth of madness or multiverse of madness should have come out before this. Yeah, that's what I read. There, there might be something missing. But here. they said that know. it actually made more sense for this story in that that Dr. Strange and the characters had really no idea what was going to happen when they dabbled with the multiverse, where if it was the other way around, that it would have made more sense with Strange's actions now that he was familiar okay. with it. Still, we'll see what happens okay. in the next movie. All right, but obviously they they f it up. They right. do, and the first one we get is the first uh, refugee from another movie that we get is Doc Ock Ex exploding this multiverse where these characters that we've known from these other Spider Man movies are now crossing over. Then you know the other characters come through, and then Sp Spider Man fights them. Once Doc Ock comes through, then. Doctor Strange is like, here's this device. You can use this to like launch people magically into my dungeon, <laughs> right? And then like more characters come through. So you know, Electro comes through and 
I think Jamie Foxx was happy that he just didn't have to get his face painted blue again. And that he didn't have a comb over. As now, this is interesting because as the lizard points out, because the lizard's already been captured in in Doctor Strange's dungeon. So we don't see an initial battle between him and Spider-Man. But um, Spider-Man goes looking and he captures Sandman, captures Electro. Jamie Foxx gets zapped in, and so does Thomas Hayden Church as Sandman. And Jamie Foxx looks a lot cooler than he did in Amazing Spider-Man looks, 2 as a like human. Jamie Fox. He looks like Jamie Foxx. And Lizard says, you look different, Max. You know, you look yeah. a lot different than when I last saw you. So there's something else going on here in between these multiverses. Is it me, since you, all right, so walk me through this, Jim, because you just watched Amazing Spider-Man 2. Did Electro know that Peter Parker was Spider-Man? No, he did not. But what's he, he did doing not. What's he, he died because he, he does team up with... Uh, Dean DeHaan's Green Goblin at the end, but he dies before the Green Goblin realizes that Peter is Spider-Man. So, so what's he doing there? There's because something... the whole spell was, it's pulling in people who from throughout the universe that know Again, I don't think they do anything by chance, and I don't think they would make a mistake that big accidentally. So I think that Doctor Strange doesn't know 100% what his spell is doing. No, it's, you know, you don't even need to see the Amazing Spider-Man to know that because when Andrew Garfield takes off his mask, Jamie Foxx says, I thought you'd be black. That is true. Yeah. You're right. But so, I was looking for a technicality as well in Amazing Spider-Man too. Like, did he know Peter Parker's name maybe and didn't know right. what his face looked like? And, right. But no, if that's the case, no, then he didn't. the vulture who definitely, well, I guess he's still in prison. Well, in then you universe. got Mary Jane, you've got Gwen Stacy, you've got, the, but they can't have a million people that, you know, I do understand No, but that. you did, you did start to see toward the end there when they're the big battle sequence uh at the statue of liberty some of the other silhouettes of his classic characters bad guy characters as rogues gallery um coming through so apparently everybody knows who peter parker is at one point or another in some galaxy in yes universe. yeah but the crux of you know the beginning of the movie is that they've captured all the villains that have come through except for norman osborne so they've Ooh, got to find him willem dafoe kills it i love him in this movie he always killed it though no i know but i think he really stepped up but i think in this movie he's hidden by a mask in most of spider-man one he is scarier without the mask than he is with the mask it's interesting he almost elongates his face when he's the green goblin like he stretches his jaw out a a different way so that he is you know he's like contorting his face so that his face looks almost like the mask i yeah i agree he's really good i mean yeah. Raimi knew what he's doing he was doing that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so so he finds aunt may they don't have to look for him very long he finds aunt may asks for help now i'm wondering how much of this was evil norman osborne playing these people and how much of it was good norman osborne you don't know you no. don't know no, he's like a golem. He's at this point, he's like, you know, he shows up to the dungeon and he until Dr. Strange comes in as the bad, you know, as the stern parent and throws him into a cell. They're prepared to let him help, you know, because he seems right. like a nice guy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah let's keep him, him out. Well, yeah. he doesn't exist in this timeline. So Tom Holland's Peter does not know who Norman Osborn is. And I like the fact that he manages to find green and purple clothes to clothe himself. Well, that's like the- <laughs> that's like, you know, how you you just stop the Hulk from being the Hulk by just take away his purple pants, right? I can help. I'm something of a scientist myself. Which exactly is a great what he says. And, yeah. yeah, that's a, that's the way he was into Yeah. I don't even want to call them Easter eggs at this point because they're just they're just callbacks to all these other movies. You know, and I mean I don't you can't even call the these cameos Easter eggs. These are just straight up these guys are getting pulled into this movie. So I did like the fact that the lizard, even though I think he looks a little bit different than he did in the Amazing Spider-Man 2, still kind of has that cheesy CG look to him. Like and that's that's why I hated you because, know Amazing because Spider-Man is because the lizard was always my favorite. Being a Godzilla cool fan, the lizard was always my favorite Spider-Man villain. And the fact that they made him like flat face, right? That yeah. He didn't look like a reptile. He just no, looked he like a, a crocodilian big... in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, like he looked like the abomination. But uh, you know, let's talk about the fact that Ned Leeds was able to somehow use this uh, sling ring to uh, open up portals. Yeah, that seemed like a throwaway. Like, oh, my grandma says I'm magic, and so... I, well, I think. But there's more. I mean, again, there's a lot of this. This movie borrows a lot from the Spider-Man. Um, 
video game from 2018, but a lot from the, the storyline that ran a couple of years ago called One More Day, in which Peter Parker makes a deal with Mephisto to save Aunt May's life. And there's a lot of stuff that they pulled in here. Um, but Ned Leeds, at one point, is the Hobgoblin. Especially when 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 you know you got the three Spider Men together and they're um, sciencing, you know how to, to cure these three guys. And Ned finds out from Tobey Maguire that his best friend turned into a bad guy and he and he died. And he's like he's like, am I going to turn into a bad guy? <laughs> yeah, it is kind of a throwaway thing, but it is it was fun in its in its excuse to get yeah. these other two Spider Men. But Tom, you know, being being who he is, but the Peter Parker that he is, and Aunt May convinces him that he needs to help these villains. And that's what he's trying to do. And that's why he has to get Dr. Strange off his back because Dr. Strange is like, let fate decide if they're going to die when they go back, it's their fate. And that's what what needs to happen. They all. Yeah. So you may think that he's cruel, but he's just really being. uh, But again, he finds out that they all died because of Spider-Man. So, you know, Am I going to become that Spider-Man? Am so when I we get the reveal of the people? other Spider-Men, he he convinces them that that's what needs to happen. And that's what they try to do for the entire rest of the, the movie. Is and this is them. the brilliance of this movie, is these three characters together. And again, Andrew Garfield, I cannot say enough good things about this character now. So first we get Andrew's reveal when when Ned opens the portal by accident and they think that it's Tom Holland's Peter down this alleyway and in comes Andrew takes off the mask in the first viewing there was an audible gasp from somebody in the audience like oh it's him and that's kind of what you hope for when you're with an audience because even though I knew in my heart of hearts that I was going to see Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire there was somebody in there that helped it along in the theater oh no my theater I could not hear the next five lines because people were screaming and cheering I mean, when Toby McGuire showed up, people in my theater clapped, you know, because people yeah. were just so excited to see him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, oh, I got goosebumps right now. It was just so funny, and it's such a heartwarming scene when MJ's throwing the bread at him. He's like, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> do something. Do something. <laughs> Even the scene where they find out that Toby McGuire's got organic webs, and they're just like, is that the only place it comes out of? Like, what's going on? <laughs> Toby's, the... but, but I love the fact that Toby's like, this is getting weird now. He's like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. No, of course not. Right. Because he just accepts it for what it is. But these guys are like, we make our own. Like, what's going on over there? Tom Holland's like, well, I fought, a, I, you know, I fought aliens in space. And then Toby's like, well, I fought I fought an alien black goo once. Right. And then then Andrew Garfield's like, well, I fought a Russian guy in a mechanical rhino outfit. Right. Which is great. Yeah. And that that leads to the whole scene of Andrew saying, well, I guess I'm not, you know, something to the effect. I guess I'm not good as you guys. It's like, you're amazing. Toby's like, say it out loud. You're amazing. This is this is where I just I want to know how much of this was on the page and how much of this was improvised, because I did read that Tom Holland hugging the two of them at the end and thanking them was completely on him. That was just him throwing himself at these two, you know, almost like, you know, thank you for passing the torch. And then they they say, okay, Peter one, Peter two. And then Andrew Garfield's like, ah, Peter three, I guess I'm Peter three. (laughs) (laughs) The interplay is just, is what you're hoping for when you sat down for this movie and you, and they give it to you. It is fan service. Yes. But I loved it all the same. Yeah. But, but as we were saying before Tom Holland's Peter has never had an Uncle Ben moment. We don't even know if he has yeah, or no, ever had right. an Uncle well, there's Ben. No, there's no tombstone next to Aunt May. Sorry. Spoiler alert. Aunt May dies. Yeah. And he never had the angst that, you know, circled around Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man with his parents, parents. you know, being killed. But we, Tom Holland does get his Uncle Ben moment when Aunt May dies at the hands of Norman Osborn as the Green Goblin. And she gives him the the correct direct from the comic book quote, whereas every other time it's been truncated. This is right up there with uh, Luke, I am your father being misquoted. So, but she, she, she throws out the, uh, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. And then she dies. And that made me sad because I love Marisa to me. Yeah. So did Happy, apparently. <laughs> so, now, so now that nobody remembers, so, so we recast a spell and now nobody knows who Peter Parker is. So 
when Aunt May dies and they go to her apartment, do they just wonder like what all this stuff in this room, this bedroom full of boy stuff is? Well, this is a big plot hole that they've not talked about, right? Okay. Does, is Peter okay. even still on the books in terms of taxes and stuff like this? You know, how well, he's got, he's now got, well, he doesn't have a, a high school record apparently because he has his GED. You know, and book. is it like Back to the Future where he disappears from photos and stuff like this? So it had to have, because you saw it, you have video evidence. That J. J. Jonas Jameson is showing everybody. So that's all but, gone. But Spider-Man still exists. Spider-Man, Spider-Man still, still exists. exists. Yeah. It has been said out there that this will be addressed in coming films. Doing the semantics of what actually this meant for everybody to right. forget him. So that will be addressed, apparently. I think this is a pro I mean, this is kind of a problem with time travel stories in general. You yeah. know, you always end up having these paradoxes and you're like, but wait a second, what about like now back to the y future? Z, you know, because it's really hard to deal with yeah. um these like time paradoxes when you introduce elements like this. And there's always going to be a segment of the audience that doesn't think about it. But then there's always going to be a segment of the audience that seems that to be overthinks very vocal, it. that overthinks <laughs> it right. and wants to have a debate about it on Are Twitter. Are you looking at us? <laughs> so, you know, I mean. It's worthy of at least mentioning. I mean, I, I assume that some of the stuff might actually be addressed in Multiverse of Madness. It could be. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so in other words, he didn't even go to his aunt's funeral. Or would you just be that? Oh, kid no, he could have. Yeah, and nobody would know who he was. Background. Yeah, like that, like that kid in uh, Tony Stark's uh, funeral. There, almost in every Spider-Man movie beforehand, there's a funeral, and it's usually in the rain and yeah. with umbrellas out. And Tom Holland's never had that. I'm like, here he goes. Not only did he get, you know, the death, he got the the line of great responsibility. He gets a funeral too, or at least a grave a yeah. gravesite visit. But. Yeah. How how many of us thought was were convinced that Tobey Maguire was going to die at the end Hands when up. he got when he got wholeheartedly stabbed. agreed that he was gone? Yeah, yeah, take him out because I was convinced the first time I saw it that just because of his entrance where he's coming back from the light that he had died in his own universe mm-hmm. that that was going to be the reveal. Well, so again, go back to Into the Spider Verse, which brilliantly dealt with this whole multiverse. Um, and this Tobey Maguire is that older Peter Parker because he makes it, he's obviously older. The guy's like 47 years old now or something, but he makes mention of the fact that, you know, MJ and I are still together. We, we make it work, but it's not perfect. So he doesn't sound like, but he said he got very bitter, you know, and this is part of the reason that plays into him stopping Tom Holland, Peter, you know, Spider-Man one from killing Norman Osborn. Mm-hmm with the glider he's like no don't go down that road i went down that road so you 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 think that this this spider-man is at the end of his run you know the whole back thing was a throwback callback to i think the second or maybe third movie where he falls and he's like i'm back and then he falls he's like oh my back my back but i guess in real life he actually hurt himself while uh filming seabiscuit mm-hmm. and uh almost didn't make it into the spider-man too but uh yeah no i could have easily seen uh, them killing him off this i was convinced that the events of loki were going to play in a major way in this well, you, multiverse you, well aspect. that's exactly th- that those purple kirby crackles that you got going across the skyline look just like the the breaking so, of the yes but so far nothing that happened in loki is having any effect as far no. as we know in this the is, MCU. Uh, this is yet another problem with all these ind- individual TV movies, because where do they fall in chronological order? Because Hawkeye, which we'll talk about next, is the most current timeline in the MCU. I think it takes place in like 2025. I can only assume that it takes place during the same time that this Spider-Man movie is taking well, place. You, because... do, you do see a Rogers, the musical billboard. When at the very beginning of the movie, yeah. when yeah, MJ yeah. and Peter are flying around, because Peter and, was and blipped. Feast, well, right, t- right. So you got to negate that five year window. You know, same thing with you know Doctor Strange was gone. So there's five years that really we haven't explored in the MCU. We just kind of skip over it because we go right from you know maybe year one or two when the Avengers are dealing with the ramifications before they actually do the whole time travel thing and reset it. But time, you know, the five years have gone by. Did that already happen or is it yet to happen? 
I think that there's a missed opportunity here, not only because I was, you know, counting up the villains at the beginning. I was like, there's only five of them. They could have done a Sinister Six easily if they just brought in one more villain. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been really cool if they brought in somebody we had never seen. Never before. seen. Well, that goes back to what I was saying before. When when everything starts breaking down in, in Strange is like, listen, they're they're coming through. You can clearly see the Rhino, um, Scorpion and um, Craven, who is getting his own movie. So imagine yeah, you could have brought in Craven. Imagine little... if they actually tried to bring in somebody from Into the Spider-Verse, an animated character. Oh, I would love to have seen Peter Porker. I would or freaking mind. A real world Nicolas Cage yes! playing his character oh, from oh, Into the Spider-Verse. I thought you were going to go Nicolas Hammond. No. You... <laughs> I will tell you, I don't know if I could. I will tell you, though, that they did have to de-age uh, Alfred Molina. Well, yeah, it's been a while. That was quite a few So, yeah, so as you were saying, Toby Maguire, they did, made no effort to de-age him. So they're not only coming from different multiverses, they're coming from different timelines in their multiverses. Right. Yeah. right, because he died when that Peter Parker was younger, you know, when Toby Maguire's character was younger. Yes, he did. So yes, he did. That makes sense. And so this is interrupting all these timelines. If they're cured when they go back, their future is rewritten now. And will it be in time? Will, will it be in time to save them all? Does Norman Osborn go back to the point right before he gets impaled? And it's all for naught, you know? So who knows? But yeah, I loved it. You know, like I said, fan service, 100% fan service is going on here. But Speaking of fan service, everyone's now screaming they want to see all three Hulks together. I'm like, just I, calm yourself, just stop. But no, I'm also reading a lot of scuttlebutt that um, Sony is considering... Um, doing a third Andrew Garfield Amazing Spider-Man movie to conclude mm. that trilogy. But only I'd like to dealt, see that. Only if it dealt with this ramification. <laughs> like, well, but he back. forgot, right? He forgot. So it wouldn't. But again, this becomes like a, How could a you thing. It's like, who are you making this movie right. for? Right, yeah. You know, who... Because if now... You, if, yeah. Because like the casual fan will be like, wait, I thought some other guy was Spider-Man. Do you know what I mean? Why, why is this right? Correct. I don't understand this. They, Did they recast they... him yet again? No, this was yeah. the guy before. This was the guy. Yeah. The and bigger that's... question is, is how would they get Emma Stone back when they're obviously exes? And, <laughs> and is that going to be awkward? <laughs> oh, that was the biggest. That, that was the biggest cheer is when Garfield Spider-Man saves MJ when she falls off. For, can we just keep Spider-Man away from any scaffolding or national <laughs> monument? I know they made a joke about the national monuments when he when because obviously he couldn't save Gwen Stacy in his universe and he saves MJ. The crowd lost their freaking minds. Oh, let me tell you, my theater, they didn't lose their minds, but there was somebody behind me in the second viewing. I oh. thought it was Abe Vigoda. He was blowing his nose so forcibly during the sad scenes. It was loud nose blowing. It wasn't the dab on the nose blow. It was elephantine nose blowing. And it was almost to the point I could just see like some guy with a huge, like a WC Fields nose, burst capillaries and everything with a handkerchief that he keeps pulling out of his, his vest pocket and blowing his nose. It happened during the reveal for Toby. It happened when Aunt May dies and it happened when um, Andrew saved MJ. Somebody couldn't control uh, their mucus. Apparently, Listen, it, there him. were some weepy moments in here. There were, sure. there were. Uh, did we all catch the fact that MJ still wearing the Black Dahlia broken necklace at the end, even though she doesn't remember Peter Parker? Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean like that. All that stuff didn't happen. It just means that she doesn't remember it. Yeah. No, I know. You know. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that it negated. Yeah. But the fact that she is wearing it. Mm hmm it's a significance to her in some way that yeah. she may not understand. So it ends with Peter. He doesn't have his Iron Man gear anymore. So he has to make himself a back to basics old this school Spider-Man costume. Screen accurate as you're going to get from a comic book suit. Almost looks like the same apartment that uh, Tobey Maguire had in the first mm -hmm. movie. Are we going to get the same uh, landlord? That would be great. <laughs> and the, the daughter that makes some cookies. Yeah, she was a little uh, much... Yeah, so I think we, one of the things, too, that's interesting is that the long shadow of Steve Rogers has hung over every film in a really interesting way because they're trying to put the Captain America shield on I Liberty. love that touch. I love that touch. And we'll get into it a little bit on Hawkeye, too, because I think that as much as people like kind of dismiss that whole 
musical. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know I do want to talk about it in the context of Hawkeye too, because it's relevant because, you know, Tony Stark was the one who sort of killed himself to save the world. Right. And I'll freely admit that Tony Stark was always my least favorite of the original Avengers. You know, I, Downey's great, but I just, as a character, I don't like Tony Stark. I have trouble caring about rich people and he is such an arrogant jerk and he like he screws things up over and over he's such a sort of typical patriarchal character like only i can fix it that's doctor and, strange and the but it's interesting how tony made the ultimate sacrifice but everybody's like but where's captain america captain america is your icon he you is know? he is uncle sam he is the guy that was front and center in the fighting the nazis yeah, and I think it's interesting how, like I said, the shadow of Steve Rogers is sort of hung over everything in yeah. such a significant way. They're not building monuments to Iron Man. You no. know, they're not no. writing musicals about Iron Man. Like no. they're rightfully it's, so. It's, it's Captain Steve, America. It's, it's Captain Steve America. Rogers. And yeah. I mean that that the, the whole crux of Falcon and Winter Soldier was I can't I can't take this shield. Right. I'm and not I, worthy. It is, it, there's too much baggage that comes with this. Shit. And I think it ties back into that feeling that Tony always had that he would never be as good as Steve because his right. dad worshipped Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers, yeah. You know, and that he always felt secondary because, you know, Howard just, you know, spent Gushed. so much of his life trying to find Steve's body. Yeah. Right. And he could never find him and it broke his heart. When Tony tried so hard to make a mark and Steve never wanted. He, want, he never, he never wanted the limelight. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, he's just a guy from Brooklyn. Yeah. Just talking this out right now. I just hope we're done with all the home title references. Oh. Because <laughs> I would have gone not home alone. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, well, this is the first one, too, that we don't get a Ramon song at the end. So is this an indication that Peter's now matured past his high school years but, but still that song was perfect three is a magic number come on yeah uh, and then that was nostalgic yeah. in itself you know schoolhouse rocks the whole thing so i was oh, yeah. like i was bawling by the end of it and that didn't help <laughs> they tapped right into you huh? they did My. so let's talk about the mid credit scene with tom hardy as venom so this is interesting because they tie this into the post credit scene at the end of venom let there be carnage when you see him get zapped Away from so they're they're saying that Venom is not part of the MCU, which you kind of assume that he was because it's a Sony movie. So you think that they were they would do everything in their power to tie their movies to the MCU. And Morbius, the trailer throws even more doubt of what's going on here because they talk about the events in San Francisco, which is a direct reference to Venom. Yet they have Michael Keaton in the trailer of Morbius. Who is the vulture? Who is in yeah. the MCU? So what is going on with yeah. Venom? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know either. And I think because obviously he doesn't know who Spider-Man was. But no, I think he doesn't. it was explained that they have a hive mentality. So was it the uh, the other Venom from yeah the, some the, universe? The, the Topher the Topher Grace Venom. Topher Grace you know, Venom knew who he was. Knew, right. Even even uh, even this new guy, what's his name? Um, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Uh, he is not. Eddie Brock is is a much more dunder. Although you can tell that Tom Hardy has a great time with this character, and you can tell that in Venom: Let There Be Carnage, and you can tell that in the little scene that he's in in this thing as not he's sure. learning about the MCU. And but he leaks part of the alien symbiote that and gets left behind. behind, and he leaves it behind. So my guess is they are now setting up the alien black suit. Go find if they, if they want to go back and rehash this storyline, which, you know, you, you said before, you can't have a Venom story without Spider-Man. So here they're setting it up. But do I really need to see this again? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, <sighs> look, it's getting more. It's getting too unwieldy, even for me. Yeah. Like, I right, right. watch the Venom <laughs> movies, you know, I'm like there's stuff that I've opted out of. There's stuff yeah. that I probably would have opted yeah. out of. If my son wasn't. Yeah, maybe if you didn't watch those, you'd probably game. actually be better off. Yeah, but it you seems know? that's Definitely. where they're going. It seems like they are trying to distance the Venom yeah. movies from the Spider-Man. So, uh, Secret Wars number eight, uh, grab it now, because it's going to go up and I already grabbed my coffee. <laughs> I don't know. All right, yeah. so how many how many buckets would we give to uh, No Way Home? 
what's up with this these these uh we believe mysterio the, like they get the, we see this in hawkeye as well the uh, thanos was right thing these are people um, who are just, they're yeah. like conspiracy theorists yeah. who yes. spend all their time watching youtube channels well i don't believe anything i i read anymore listen i got you know? multiple spider-men running around what the hell am i gonna believe so and then in fact that happens when peter goes into the high school because the one guy keeps like keeps spouting things and the other teacher is like he's a he's a conspiracy theorist i love that they're in this martin star and jb smooth i love that scene you know feel free crawl on the ceiling if it gets too crowded go ahead we know you can do it (laughs) so again would would that display case still exist or was it all blipped away I mean, maybe the picture of Peter would be gone, but it would be like a tribute, tribute to Spider-Man. To Spider-Man. Uh, I'm going to go a solid four just because it was entertaining. It, it's like I said, I walked out of the theater and I still wasn't really into the Spider-Verse is, is already done this and it and much better. This was a lot of fan service, although it was incredibly fun. You know, two years down the road, this is on flipping channels i will absolutely i recommend watching the originals if you have the time and watching this a second time i think it'll raise it in your estimation raise it yeah yeah um i'm also gonna say four because it was it was fun i honestly i feel like i bumped it up like half a bucket just for toby mcguire i love him so much yeah you can't deny it you you can't deny it said his you know you know, his it's there in his, in his eyes. eyes. It's in his eyes. That is such a, that is spot on. To a and lot I, of people, he will always be the one and true Spider-Man and Peter Parker. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, well, and I just, yeah. just seeing him, uh, like I said, it was like, it just warmed my whole heart so much to see him. And I was so happy. I, you know, it just reminds, reminded me too, like I said, of like Pleasantville and all the other roles that I loved seeing him in. I just... He's always been one of my favorites, so um, I was so happy to see him. And I do think that those scenes when the three of them are together are some of the best scenes yes. in the film. It is mm-hmm. long, though. Let's let's put that out there. It's long. So. It's a lot for a film that's about one character. Yeah, and I can't imagine them actually introducing any more than they did because it would be even longer. So yeah, no, I, I think agree. it would have just been a fun cameo. You yeah. can't bring in another Well, you do like- miss, you do ask yourself, well, how about this? How about this? They couldn't right. really conceivably do that without it being a four hour odyssey, you know? Right. And yet somehow Into the Spider-Verse pulled in six characters and, pu- and played it off brilliantly. Yeah, but these were characters that you weren't, familiar with already if you see toby Maguire and andrew garfield come in you just don't want to you know you want to know what they're doing you want to know you you, you want to hear the banter so i think for me there was a lot more emotion in this than there was in into the spider verse so i'm going four and a half buckets i really okay, really like it fair enough i do i do want to point out because my son was thrilled with this uh he has a buddy who lives in queens and the apartment building that that peter moves into at the end is right across the street from his house. So he has photos of them filming him in the pie spider suit coming out the window and um, was tickled pink. So as a tie-in to Spider-Man and Hawkeye, and there's a few, is Norman Osborn's penthouse the same place where Kate Bishop's mom lives? Is it the same building? Because it seems like very yeah, similar, Osborne, the shots. Yeah, but they said that Norman Osborn does, uh, Oscorp doesn't exist in this uh, time. No, I mean, like in real world, were they using the same building for the oh, exterior no. shots? I didn't notice. Uh, the original Oscorp building was uh, was a not uh, Oscorp. Uh, the no. Norman Osborn's penthouse from the Tobey uh, Maguire that's a good question, trilogy. Because that was that was actually very iconic. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That would be interesting. But uh, let's go to the concession stand now, and we'll be back, and we'll talk about Hawkeye. Hey Spidey, isn't Marvel's new Pizzazz magazine fantastic? Fantastic, but not perfect. But Pizzazz has the lowdown on Jaws too, and more Sean Cassidy picks than his mother. It's sensational. Sensational, but not perfect. How about Pizzazz's goofy guide to TV? It's wild look at sci-fi movies. It's games, puzzles, comics. What could be more perfect? Me on the cover. Not the Hulk. Pizzazz, the almost perfect new monthly from the Off the Wall Gang at Marvel Comics. All right, we're back and we watched the whole six episode ark of yeah. Hawkeye. And we're here. We didn't to want talk to talk about, about the Doctor Strange trailer at all. Well, no. I, I no. attempted to not really pay attention okay, to the Doctor what, Strange. Once a, I realized what I was watching, what I'm was like, oh, this on? is a trailer. You're like, it was a trick. It was a trick. Yeah. They tricked you. 
So, yeah. all right. Yeah, that is, that is the end end credit. If you sit all the way through the movie, you will get a trailer for uh, Into the Multiverse of Madness. And it made yeah. you mad. I'm yeah. not anti-trailer, so I was like, cool. That's the yeah. first I've seen. Uh, I, I, didn't, the... I didn't want, it dropped online like the next day. Like it was, you know, oh, here's the trailer. It's like, well, I just saw it in a the theater. Honestly, so. I'm just excited because Sam Raimi's directing it. Sam Raimi hasn't directed a movie since Oz the Great and Powerful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like Isn't James that Franco. crazy? He hasn't mm. directed a film. Since what have you been doing, Sam? He's been producing stuff. Uh, he's been doing other things, but he hasn't actually directed a film. Mm. And, you know, Jim knows how much I love the Evil Dead movies. Yeah. And the, I, I'm so excited to see what he's going to do with this. And given how much I like his, his Spider-Man films, you know, I, I just am really excited to see yeah. what energy he's going to bring to this. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about this movie being fan service and i think that that may be even more so multi versus yeah. madness yeah we'll see i just uh, want to see how bruce campbell is going to be involved <laughs> in multi versus of madness and the, i hope he shows up like multiple versions of him and the delta 88 which is in all of sam's, that is true of sam's movies yes. and ted ramey <laughs> and ted ramey of course uh, ted has yeah. to be in there yeah yeah it's in um, all his contracts i'm very excited i'm very excited to see it sort of less because it's Doctor Strange and more because I'm excited about Sam Raimi and also what like he's bringing to this. Yeah, but it, it seems right like on. this material is right up his alley. So yeah. I, this it can't lose. It really can't lose. And Troy Del IJ4 is coming back and I'm just very excited because we and haven't seen him in... since the first Doctor Strange film. That is true. Yeah, that seems forever yeah, ago. I know, For right? All the movies that have come between, it seems forever yeah. ago. The first. It just Doctor sounds like they're, they're, they're once again they're starting to jam a lot into these movies. But I guess we'll uh, we'll wait. It drops in May, I think. May or I think March, March actually. Yeah, it's earlier. It wow. Yeah. That's, That's right only around a couple the corner. Months away. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So there you go. So Hawkeye. I, yeah. I'm impressed. I, I think that this probably has a slightly different viewing when you guys, you probably binged all six within a couple yes. days yeah. where I watched it each week. Um, and I, I unfortunately watched it after Christmas. And this is makes no bones about being a Christmas set this show. Is absolutely. You hear like you, every Christmas song ever made during the runtime yeah. of Hawkeye. I'm exaggerating, yeah. but there's a lot of Christmas <laughs> stuff going on here. Can I just say straight up that the the opening scene of the family coming out of the hotel is the peninsula. And that's where I stayed when we, we went down to Radio City. And if I had known that they had filmed this here, I probably would have geeked out a little bit more. I was there. Unfortunately for me, like this show really didn't sort of hit its stride until like the end of the third episode. I completely agree. Yes. And that's really to its detriment because obviously like if people to watch the first episode and they're not that into it you know and they're like yeah let's go and they don't watch the rest of it they're gonna miss i think a really good show but the problem on my end at least was um kate bishop i think that she's written very young um Something about the way they wrote her character, she did not I, feel like a 22 year old. She felt like she was 17. I, and in the comics, I think she is younger. Um, and they wrote her so young. And Haley Steinfeld is 25, which is fine if you're playing a 22 year old, but her character felt younger. So in the first couple episodes, yeah. I'm going, she's too old to be Kate Bishop. What did they do? And it felt so jarring. Hmm. And Kate, as a character, is just less interesting to me, especially at the beginning, because I think that Hawkeye's journey is so compelling, you know, as this guy who's not super powered, as right. this guy who doesn't have all the advantages of the other Avengers. Oh, they banged it over your head with that throughout this whole thing, too. And, you know, he's just, he's an old soldier who's kind of had enough of this life. You know, he's not a god. He's not a super soldier. His body is going. His hearing is going, which is so significant, you know, because he's, he's in his middle age. Think about it. And yeah. his body is like, you know, a 75-year-old man. Oh, yeah. He's beat up. And he has you know, young kids, you know, his youngest son is still quite young and he just wants to like have that life. He's like, okay, I've had enough. And you can tell how uncomfortable he is with this idea that he saved the world, you know, like yes. when they give him 
like the free meal at the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you can tell mm-hmm. that he just doesn't. No, he's not looking for that, those accolades. No. Yeah. Plus the fact that he's well aware that he was the Ronin and he did unspeakable things, you know, not only then, Correct. but I'm sure in his previous history as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not a hero. You know, you don't know what I've yeah. done. No. Right. And that that is that is what he keeps throwing out there. Uh, I really like this a lot. I, mm-hmm. you know, again, watching it week in, week out. A lot of people complained early up front. Not enough action. Listen, not everything can be endgame. These are carried these these TV shows are character studies, and he is one of the lesser Avengers that really re- was relegated to the background. Um, and they they set it up brilliantly up front that Kate, as a little kid, is witness to the attack on New York City. It's amazing how we keep coming back to that New York City uh, assault where the world was introduced to the Avengers, and she sees him, and this changes her world. You know, she lives very isolated. She has wealthy parents. She lives in this upscale apartment and she just excels at everything. Yeah, I, I, I she is very naive, I think, um, in the way that she is written. She's 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 gobsmacked in meeting him because he is her idol because he doesn't have superpowers. He's just a guy with a bow and arrow. This whole storyline is set up to replace him. He is this. He is now mentoring her to become this role. Like the, one of the reasons why the first two episodes don't work as much for me is because every time that it was sort of like solo Kate's story, I just wasn't interested. I didn't find her as interesting a character. And part of it is because she acted so childishly. She is like, very childish. Like the way she responds when she finds out her mother's engaged. It's like, you're 22. You don't have to live with this guy. I was shocked that her mother wasn't more questioning is why is my young daughter hanging out with this old guy? Mm-hmm. It doesn't yeah, even matter that he's creepy. an Avenger, There's right? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe just <laughs> ma- him a pass. maybe to make it less creepy, maybe she was meant to be younger. To make it less creepy, maybe they pushed more her up like a, a few years. Because that would be my thing. first thought. I'm like, well, yeah, I you're hot guy. What are you doing with my daughter? You know, why yeah, are you so interested in her? A 17 year old. I do. Yeah. I do like that. I, I liked her character. I like Haley Steinfeld. I thought they had great chemistry together. And when they bring in Florence Pugh, I thought the two of them were magical. Yes. I mean, we well, talk about we talk about the screen, you know, of the of the three Spider Men, but the two of them together. Um, uh, well, I mean, like Yelena really brightens things up generally. I mean, I think <laughs> so, she she just kills this character. Yeah, she that's was. when it got more interesting for me is when yeah. she comes which, into which it. I debated with my son whether or not she was even going to show up in this show because obviously they set it up at the end of Falcon and Winter Soldier. Oh no, I'm sorry, it was at the tail end of Black Widow. See, I right. can't even keep these things straight anymore. Right. Uh, and it's like, well, are they going to follow through on that storyline? But they really doubled down on the whole Ronin thing. You bring in Echo, who has her own story. You know, and she was fantastic. And she like, is. That was deaf, when she is a deaf actress. Yes, and yeah. also an amputee. So yes, very yeah. cool. Maya, to me, that was when the series really got interesting because I felt she was just a much more compelling character than Kate even though they had both they had literally both had the same kind of loss like they both lost mm-hmm. their fathers tragically there was just something about Maya that was a much more interesting character and I was rooting so hard for her I'm like come on Maya see the light like he's not a bad guy be a hero you know like I just really wanted her to you know come around and she does and it's it, to me her journey is so interesting and Hawkeye's journey is so interesting. And yeah. I think that one of the things that I like too is that you see this whole other dimension of Laura, which isn't revealed until the very end, you know, but yeah. the whole time I'm going like she speaks German, she can do all this research. Like what is going on over here? You yeah, know? she's kind of, she's kind of like the DC version of Oracle where she's in the <laughs> background and, and you're like, wait a minute, what are they doing here? Like, um, because you get- And, and she's completely thing. aware of the Ronin and his history. So, yeah. and she's yeah, not no, shying no. away. Yeah. And it's, she knows all about his work. She knows all about the tracksuit gang. Like she knows everything. And I'm like, man, we did not get to see this side of Laura. I in know, the film. I know. No, and I, and, and she's, the, she's the, the guy the in the chair. Of, she's Ned to Hawkeye. Yeah. She's the guy yeah, in the chair. That's a, be- that's a better reference. Yeah. So, but like you said, we were introduced to, uh, to Clint and his family in the, because remember his whole family was blipped. 
Mm -hmm. So now he's trying to, you know, he's got five years, which he lived without these people. And now he's, you know, he's bringing the kids to the city or whatever. But this opening number of being in this musical, which is obviously a very big uh, Hamilton homage, is this cheesy production of Rogers the Musical, which retells the story of the Avengers, Captain America. You can only see, we only see this one number, you know, save the city. And this song is like so worm, earwormy, and it's silly. I could do this all day. Like, like I've put this on numerous times. You can download the song and listen to it. And it's at, meant to kind of turn people off because, you know, Hawkeye gets up and walks out. The like, look on he, his face I, when it pans over to him. Genius. He's, because he's just like, this is, that's my life up there. You know, but they throw in Ant-Man. Ant-Man wasn't there, but for some reason... You know, uh, how do they know about the shawarma? Who, who sat down and did an interview and said then afterwards we went and got shawarma? But it's in the lyrics and it's just, it's such a great moment. And at the very tail end, you get the full number in the end credits. And again, people lost their minds because they just assume that they want some other setup for the next movie and just enjoy this for what it was. But yeah, I think they did their job too well, which is certain amount of people were completely turned off by this, but I enjoyed it. I loved it because it, it just puts all these superheroes in context to the, the bigger world that they now deal with. You know, we talked about in, uh, in Spider-Man that you've got, you know, they're, they're retrofitting the Statue of Liberty with Captain America's shield. But that's a really important thing here. This is Rogers, the musical. You know, it's always about Steve. And I just think it's so interesting the way he's this this symbol um and what he sort of means to the general public versus you know obviously what he means you know yes. to the individuals on the avengers which you know obviously they talked about it at falcon the winter soldier like what he meant personally to the two of them um it, i think it's just real interesting that they chose that it's rogers the musical you know i would love to see old man rogers being the consultant <laughs> during during rehearsals of the musical yeah. it was shawarma um yeah. ant-man wasn't there but i'll i'll allow yeah, it you know? <laughs> i'll sign i'll sign off on that somebody pointed out online that they really missed an opportunity here to have sam and bucky watching the musical <laughs> and they just kind of turn and look at each other and shake yeah, it they, like, they could still do that they might <laughs> they still could, do it yeah. with the with yeah. a season two of falcon and winter soldier but for me going into this hawkeye even as the comic i was never really interested in his character uh, he was just there as yeah. uh superfluous he wasn't me meant nothing to me and even more so in the avengers he was the by far the least interesting character in the first avengers you know it didn't help they didn't give much to do but well, um, possessed three quarters of the, the movie as well. So and going into this, I wasn't excited to watch it because of that. I'm like, OK. And so it took those other characters to make me invested. Hawkeye himself didn't do it. And the fact that they his nemesis are the tracksuit mafia. Who's really? hiring these people, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> this is this is taken right from Matt Fraction's uh, Hawkeye uh, miniseries, by the way. There's a lot of this stuff that they pulled. And uh, but yeah, this this tracksuit mafia, which comes right from the comics. Are, are like the kingpin is hiring these people really why because they are horrible at their job and do we assume that ronan during that end game spell he went after the kingpin at some point you would think that he that would be his number one target would be the that's kingpin who, as ronan even he, he, even he said he stayed him. away he stayed away from him that was his big concern that kingpin was going to get involved uh i don't know the obviously the uh the death of armand and this whole thing you know jack being the the killer was such a red herring but jack is the swordsman in comic book lore and he was hawkeye's mentor they don't go down that road they don't and i enjoyed this character immensely this is this is uh now uh, um kate's mom's fiance and he's just played as a doofus they make him almost like comically evil right he's got like the evil he's, man well, that's what I'm saying. It's, like it's, the... it's so it is a red herring because you assume that he is the bad guy but that's not the case at all. They turned the tables on that, the expectation. So I enjoyed it. And his character was funny. So I yeah, did appreciate it. I mean, you it. got a guy who gets, he gets, he gets ratted out that, you know, they, they arrest him for murdering this guy with a sword. He gets free and then shows up at a party wearing a sword. And I'm like, yeah. dude, that is balls right there. Like, that's like, yeah. like, that is wealth and privilege. Yeah, you know? basically. Yeah. I really did like uh, Kate Bishop as a character. Uh, I like the fact that by the end of it, she's marginally better at what she's trying to do 
that she doesn't magically become this this killer superhero um she's barely landing she's you know she's flopping around to save her life especially when she's getting her ass kicked by uh, yelena that nice little uh, fight scene going through the office was was well choreographed it was fun I mean, in the uh, elevator, it's hilarious because the elevator again. This is this is where the two of them <laughs> just—they're not even saying anything, and yet they're electric together on screen. Like you want to see a buddy comedy with these two. I don't know. I have this theory that Florence Pugh has chemistry with everybody. Yeah, because... she could do that with anybody. She was in I, an elevator. You with... know, uh, <laughs> yeah, that whole scene where she goes, where she's in Kate's apartment and she's eating the mac and cheese, like. It's riveting. Like, that's right up there with, like, friggin', you know, um, uh, Inglorious Bastards when you have uh, Christoph Waltz just sitting there at the table and he's just commanding the screen. When she it, picks up the plastic fork and she's like, this is not cutlery, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> like, is that only one? I'm only one person. <laughs> I really did enjoy this. I, I, I liked immensely the introduction of Echo. Uh, Kazi seemed like maybe he could have been something, but they dispense with him but let's talk about vincent d'onofrio because this was this big huge hidden storyline that no everybody knew was coming but there he was um only My to get son shot about the- went through the roof when you know he was revealed and then in the at the end of the credits they show the shot the silhouette of kingpin over the credits and he was like oh, you know just so excited yeah. to see him and yeah. he is so good in that part and i don't remember this so much in daredevil but they maximize his size in this and i don't know if it's just extra shoulder pads obviously you know we all know the trick which is if you wanted something to look massive on screen you shoot it down up and he just fills that screen he just he just takes over and um he becomes he is the kingpin of course people like you shot him and i'm like you don't bring that guy back for one episode to kill him he's not dead no, well, you don't know. You don't know what happened. So the thing is, well, like if you read the comic away, books, you do know if they follow the comic book storyline, he goes blind. Right. He is shot because he does have super strength. And this is the one thing. If you own one of those old school Marvel handbooks, he wasn't just a big fat guy like he was pure muscle. I think in the Frank Miller run, there was an issue where he got up in the morning and like beat up ninjas like that was his workout in the morning. This guy is just a because he takes an arrow. He's taken, he's getting, he's getting blown up and yet he gets, he's, he's getting run over by a car and yet he just continues to get back up. So even though he doesn't have superpowers per se, the guy is abnormally strong. So the idea that one gunshot to the face may take him down, uh, I'm thinking. See, you definitely see that when he's fighting with Kate, because she shoots him point blank with yeah. the arrow in his chest right. and he just like yeah, he pulls just it out. Like, it out. It's, yeah. like it's a, just an irritation. Yeah. So, no, he is not dead by any means. If anything, they may blind him. And then now he's got, you know, now he's got a detriment just like Daredevil and and Echo. So now when Yelena comes into this, it's revealed that Kate's mom has hired her to kill Hawkeye. Uh, That is that is the way it plays out. But I'm assuming didn't didn't this happen at the end of yeah Black Widow? But no, but I get the impression that this um, Julie Louis-Dreyfus's character is kind of like the handler of these other characters and like she sets them on mission so she's probably getting contact she's probably yeah i don't think valentina uh, hires anybody i think she's like a power broker something yeah puts people in contact with other people there you go so but yelena didn't seem to know exactly who hired her to do this so you'd think that she would have her stuff together where she's going to investigate everything before she actually carries out with this job and maybe because it's Hawkeye, she had some emotional involvement. Well, she only thing, needed yeah. that reason to go after him at this point. And you get the reveal that she wants to see the new and improved Statue of Liberty while she's in New York. Yes. Which is a callback. Yeah. So you're asking yourself, OK, though, this must happen before the big fight in or they've actually repaired the shield and it's back Put on the back. Statue of back Liberty there. now. Minor setback. Yeah. Well, that's again like this whole timeline thing, and like when does this stuff happen in relation to the other things? It's like you should should, should need a guidebook to watch yes. a TV yeah. show about superheroes. <laughs> like I said, they make it so obvious that this is a Christmas set show, and then they have the Christmas scene at the end of Spider Man. So I just assume that they're happening at the same time. Who knows? Mm. Who knows? Yeah. I don't now, know. The first fight uh, Kate and Clint have when they're actually when Clint gets himself captured at the beginning, 
And uh, Linda Cardellini's character as his wife says, oh, that's one of Natasha's favorite moves. Yeah, it's catch and release. So I'm going to go get myself caught. And they're in a KB toy warehouse. Yeah. Now, is this a reference to Kate Bishop? Is that so obvious that, you know, that's why they okay, chose this location? Interesting. Yeah. I didn't make that connection. My husband loves that their moving company is Trust a Bro. Trust a Bro. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, like, why is Hawkeye even messing? You know, why does the Kingpin hire the tracksuit mafia? And they're going right. through the history of tracksuits. There's one funny scene where the, the two guys in the truck are like, you know, Royal Tenenbaums. It's like, Royal Tenenbaums? Do we look like the Royal Tenenbaums? Yes, you do. Yeah, yes, It's Ben do. Stiller's tracksuit. And they call everyone bro, <laughs> even right. women. Bro. They even Kate Bishop. Bro. Yeah, yeah, thank you, bro. bro. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is a great scene where she tells the guy he should call his girlfriend and you know, that he made a mistake and yes, right. all this stuff. And then he comes back later and he's like, I just want to thank you for telling me to call my girlfriend. We went to see Maroon 5 instead. Yeah, I don't know if that was a win. <laughs> I, would have, I would have chosen Imagine Dragons over that, but that's just me personally. And then she's like, but what about the gun? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah, sorry, bro. <laughs> but we also get the Yelena reveal that she blipped out. Yeah. During the that, five yes, years. That was interesting. Interesting because I don't think we've seen the blip from the point of view of the blipped before. You know, we've seen what happens to other people who've watched it, but we haven't seen a person like she yeah. went to the bathroom, she blipped out, and then she was there again. When she came out, things were completely different. We have not seen that point of view. That is that is a good point. Yeah, that was interesting because she was just like, what's go? Who are you? What is, you know, what is going on? Yeah, because mm -hmm. the, the lady that she went in with and suddenly has a kid and a husband and. Yeah, that was a missed opportunity. I think that that stain should have still been in the rug. Oh, you didn't clean the stain. I see. <laughs> I would still have been there five years later. But was Kate was or her mother blipped? You assume no, that they weren't. Right. I think that to me, you know, besides Hawkeye's journey, which was, I did, I did think he was compelling. And one of the things I really enjoyed were his interactions with the LARPers. Where... That was actually very entertaining. That was that was a lot of fun, actually. Again, you know, the same thing with with Kate, who, you know, they're looking up to him and they're like, this is the this is close as I'll ever get to be in a superhero. Yeah. You know, and it's very funny because I did watch a show with my wife and had to explain to her what a LARP was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, how are you married to me and not know what this is? But apparently she did not know. And then was like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, that's what people do. And But here's the thing at the end. These are all New York firemen and cops. Mm -hmm. Why did they feel the need to actually get back into their costumes in order to command any kind of presence to control this crowd? Could they have just made a phone call or flashed their badges and been like, I'm, I'm a NYPD, follow me. No, we had to get in our costumes, which... I guess if I had a costume, I would have jumped on it as well. It's like, give me five minutes. Give me five minutes to put my rubber sword on. I'll be right back. I got your back, Hawkeye. I got your back. But that that fight scene in Rockefeller uh, Center was a lot of fun. And I loved the little callback to the owl. Do you guys remember maybe two years yes, ago? Yes, I do. It was I a real owl that... Yeah. I said that my husband was like, oh, that's so cute. I'm like, that's because there was a real there owl a in the owl. tree. Yeah, they had to relocate him. And I mm -hmm. want to say that they... Uh, they named him Broadway or Madison. I don't remember now. But um, when Kate shoots the uh, track suit truck and it shrinks and then the owl takes it away, are we just left to assume that he ate those guys? Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> that is brutal. That's that's exactly what happens. That is exactly what happens. <laughs> and I don't want to know any different. No. Yeah. So, so another uh, New York landmark is destroyed. So the tree is destroyed. You yeah, we're running out of landmarks. You here. can't do anything in New York with, without destroying something monumental. Yeah. Couldn't he climb down the tree? Was he really that stuck that he couldn't? He's an Avenger. <sighs> there's gotta, He's Hawkeye. There's got to be a lot of wire. There's got to be like just thousands of lights in there. So because he goes in there. I can't do anything. I'm sorry. I'm stuck I'm in stuck. the tree. I'm stuck. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. It was this series definitely had its moments. But like I said, I felt it was a very slow start. And um, to me, especially at the beginning, just whenever Kate was sort of by herself away from Hawkeye, I was starting to go to myself, like, how come we're not seeing more Clint? 
you know I, yeah when he when he chases her away there then he's like that's it we're done we're that, done some I, some I, of the negative reviews have said that it feels like just a setup for this kate bishop character for the future which you know a lot well, of marvel is. things do yeah i mean it I, is but I, you I, also have to acknowledge that like there are people who like this character yes. and i do think jeremy renner is good in this role yeah no i thought he really stepped up in this role i thought he was fantastic because again like you like jim said you know he his character got shuttled to the sidelines for a lot of the bigger avengers movies so this was this was nice for him to get his own kind of just all i want to do is get home for christmas for my family i'm i'm stuck in this situation i kind of created it and i just need to fix it so this is like the marvel version of planes trains and automobiles <laughs> yeah, i just want to get home yeah. all i want to do is get home and you get the ultimate mom guilt at the end. Is this what heroes do? Turn Arrest their mothers on <laughs> Christmas Day? <laughs> well, if your mom wasn't a jerk, maybe I wouldn't have arrested you. You framed your fiance. Mm -hmm. You hired this girl to kill my best friend now. The one guy I respect in this world. Oh, man. But let's talk about this watch. Because I think this, this has bigger implications. We brought it up at the beginning. This, yeah. this little MacGuffin that during this, I guess somebody went in and pilfered dish that was laying around in Avengers Tower after it got destroyed. I guess And they so. not only got a hold of uh, Ronan's swords and suit, but also this watch, which we didn't really know why they were after it. And we still don't really know why they were after, other than the fact that it was... Agent Clint, 19's. Clint got it back <laughs> and gave it to his wife, which we're assuming is hers. It has because, a shield logo on it. Right. And, and she, Agent 19 is Mockingbird. Yes. Who did date Hawkeye? Well, they were married at one point. But if you watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Adrian Palicki played Bobby Morse, who is Mockingbird. So, and at one point, she was supposed to get her own TV show. And so that I never panned out. Some dueling theories about this. So okay. theory one is that they're just going to write out the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. storyline, which is possible which... because they apparently did a lot of weird time travel stuff and all this other thing. But Kevin Feige has said that he actually really likes Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So he's sort of a fan. So the other theory is that Agent 19 is a title that can get passed on to different people. Okay. Okay. So like after Laura retired, then Bobby Morse took over. I like that. And I buy that. You know, because and that then, way, it, then it, that and that keeps Agents of Shield. Yes, because MCU they've been on the fence about whether or not this is even going to be any kind of continuity, regardless of the fact that they brought in Coulson. Right. Um, I did like that show a lot. They did introduce a lot of these characters that could come back. Quake, you know, that's where we got our Ghost Rider. So even though he's looking like he's getting recast. So that goes a long way to explaining why she's so keyed in on everything yes. that Clint does. Well, think about that. Right. You would have to be somebody in the industry, whether they work together as S.H.I.E.L.D. agents before he became, quote unquote, Hawkeye. Yeah. If your husband's running around because he was like best friends with, with Black Widow, they were constantly on adventures together. Oh, I'm off to Budapest with, uh, with uh, uh, Nat again. Oh, really? Are you now? Yeah. OK. What's going on there? So, so basically it makes more sense right it's it an office romance <laughs> yeah. he met her on the job listen you can't you can't fight alongside somebody at, you know without eventually uh yeah so, I, I i do yeah i like that theory a lot that she retired and it was just given to bobby morris mm -hmm. and then that keeps her in the continuity keeps agents of shield in the continuity but right. you know th there's this big question hanging over all of these adjacent marvel properties that were not owned by disney right Correct. all the defender yeah. stuff mm -hmm. um so now we know yes daredevil is going to be incorporated in yep. but how much of daredevil will be incorporated no right in? it may you just know? be that character in kingpin and negate the storylines that took place we, he just now exists in this universe but i think which that, again is very confusing and very right. convoluted but you know you just end yeah. up having like all these kind of like dangling threads out there yeah. and i just think you're Again, like the appearance of 
Charlie Cox it was as Matt Murdock was great, but at it the was, same yep. time, you're like, it's like what if are the you don't know anything about no, the series, right. you're just like, who's this guy? Oh. So if they do anything else with Daredevil, if they introduce him as a Spider-Man character now going forward, if he's in the next Spider-Man movie, maybe. Well, Echo um, is getting her own TV show and Echo is very much a Daredevil character, as yeah. is Kingpin. Yeah. So, so anybody that is unaware of Daredevil could say, oh, it's the guy from No Way Home. And if anybody is so inclined, they have that to go back to. And maybe they'll have an Easter egg every once in a while that refers yeah. back to the show. But again, I think that's what they do so well. It's like the history is there if you want it. And right. they don't really make it yeah. um, required viewing if you don't want to go back and take yeah. that um, leap into the Netflix shows. Yeah, don't don't forget. I don't know if they've they had. I don't. Loki is the only show so far that's been officially picked up for a second season. But Kate's mom is going to need a really good lawyer. Mm. So, well, I think the interesting just throwing thing it out there. If he's not busy with Peter Parker, too, is that if Daredevil gets folded into the Spider Verse, which seems like it's going to, will they kind of reboot the series with the same actor and make it more family friendly and it'll end up on Disney plus or like he'll get his own movie or I don't know. Yeah. I could see him kind of popping in and out of some of these shows and then maybe being part of a, like a defenders, a, a real defenders, not the one that they did. I, but then, yeah, maybe he'll just get his own movie. And you then know, the multiverse will open up and Ben Affleck will walk through. I think he's such a, oh, please no. <laughs> please I, think, no. <laughs> I think there's such, he's such an important character for a lot of people. Like Daredevil was always my husband's favorite, you know? Mm. So in a way it almost feels glaring that he's not included in the MCU. He hasn't yeah. been included up to this yeah. point. So, you know, but he is a more, he is a, a grittier character. So I mean, multiverse of madness could open up all of these characters to potentially now exist in the MCU. But what There's they have obviously... to do with multiverse of madness, they have to tie it into Loki somehow because Loki can't exist yes, in a vacuum. No, no, because that was huge ramifications. Uh, yeah, that's got to start playing out. And this, this whole is thing this is the were... phase four. This is I, I'm already hearing about leaks about phase five. And I'm like, can we just get through four first? Well, they're setting up, you know, it was very clear that they were setting up King the Conqueror to be a kind of Thanos. Yeah. And, you know, given that, the question then becomes how come they haven't started to drop more Kang Easter eggs into these right. films? Because, like, you yeah. saw Thanos before anybody who didn't read the comics sure. knew he was yeah. Thanos, right? And so I'm just surprised that Kang hasn't played, like, you didn't see anything about Kang in Spider Man. No, not, especially not a thing because like, you're dealing with multiverse and you can't go 10 years before this plays out you can't pull off another 10 year run of no. introducing these you have it's got to be a much shorter especially timeframe. with the number of properties that they keep releasing because before it was yeah. like one movie a year right yeah, like yeah, no, one yeah. movie it would be one big movie and you would what, go and see that one big movie now it's like there's two or three movies a year and there's two tv shows and there's two or three tv uh -huh. shows yeah. you know i mean this is just a lot and i yeah. i really think at some point this dam is going to burst and people are going to be like i can't even it's keep too much of it it's too right yeah so at what point does king reset everything and we just get new actors for all these characters and we just have all new stories right because kang don't is, forget kang is the reset button it could very well be don't forget that disney now owns everything that 20th century fox owned and they're sitting on the fantastic four they are sitting on the entire x-men universe that's money in the bank right there. That is just bubbling to the top, especially when you bring in King the Conqueror, who is so integral to Fantastic Four storyline. I'm enjoying this run. Listen, if you told me at eight years old, I'd be on a podcast talking about complaining about too much Marvel content <laughs> and TV shows and on movies, I would have laughed at you. No, first you'd say, what's a podcast? First, That is true. <laughs> I still, like the people, radio. I still have people who ask me what podcast is yeah it's a radio show on the computer <laughs> oh really where can i see you well you can't see me so just, should we wrap up hawkeye here How i think we, we need to wrap up it? hawkeye yes uh i enjoyed it i'm gonna give it a solid four as a series 
in comparison to the other Marvel series. I did like this a lot. I'm happy with the introduction of uh, Kate Bishop. Uh, we will be seeing Young Avengers at some point. I'd give it three and a half. Again, you know, I wasn't that invested going into it, um, but it won me over in the last three episodes. You know, you can't go wrong with the Elena and then the reveal of the Kingpin. So three and a half from me. Uh, and I'm going to say the same. It was a slow start for me. And again, not because I wasn't invested in Clint Barton. I thought he was great. I just, I wasn't that interested in Kate Bishop as a character for the first couple episodes. And, you know, it really didn't start to coalesce for me until the third episode. So slow start took off some buckets for me. So there you go. That was marvelous. I got it. I got your dad joke. Did you? I did. They're not just dad jokes. They're just (laughs) jokes. They're dad jokes. (laughs) They're just jokes. So next week is in question. It's like a choose your own adventure kind of a thing. Next week. (laughs) If you go to page 18, we could be covering Power of the Dog, which, you know, speaking of Doctor Strange, has a very different turn from Benedict Cumberbatch, um, along with a movie I haven't seen for decades. Really? I thought you were going to say never saw. Silverado, 1985 Western with a lot of big names. That's what I said. Starring basically everybody. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The number of people who even just show up in small roles in there, like John Cleese is in it. Jeff Goldblum is in it. You know, you're just like, oh, look, there's another person I know. Oh, look, there's another person I know. So next week will either be a Western themed episode or go to page 20. And this is contingent on this dropping on VOD, if it ever happens in the next week, Nightmare Alley with a co-feature that we have yet to choose. So Suspiria. it could be Suspiria. it could be one or the other. It could be one or the other. Suspiria, could, you think so? It could, it could be Suspiria. Okay. okay. <laughs> Which might be our only chance to ever talk about Suspiria. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Jeff will not be with us next what? week. There is outrage among our listeners right now, Jeff. Well, you I heard not you're going to recover us. Suspiria. So I'm, <laughs> I'm like, screw this. I'm like, I'm out. Yeah, apparently I'm heading north and you guys are heading west. So. I think probably the likelihood is that we're going to end up having a Western-themed episode because I don't think that Nightmare Alley is going to be no. really some video on demand in the next week or so. I haven't seen any indication that that is going to happen. I will tell you, I, I will gladly watch Nightmare Alley, but... Well, I'm just surprised it's not playing anywhere near you guys. I mean, it's it playing is, around it's here. Playing like... one, it's two theaters, but one of them's uh, a hall. Mm-hmm. But it's only once a day. It's it's a once, yeah. Yeah, it's you crazy. can tell it's at the end of its theatrical run. It's probably not a lot of people have gone to see it, so it's being phased out of theaters. I'm surprised. It, Guillermo, right? But he yeah, didn't direct it. Did he direct it? He did direct no. it. Oh, he and did it's, direct it's it. It's the first film he's directed since Shape of Water, which he won an Oscar what? for. So you'd think there'd be a bigger push. You think there for would this be. film in the theaters? It just came out on December 17th. Hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we'll see. So most mm-hmm. likely we'll be talking Power of the Dog next which week. Which is on Netflix. So, and this is a movie that you really can't talk about without spoilers so if you're interested in hearing our conversation about it please go and watch power of the dog on netflix i guess i'm gonna have to watch it just so i can listen to the episode this is the only second episode i've ever missed i think jurassic world i can only mark you absent twice i think you're right there you go yeah so it happens life gets in the way sometimes sorry all those jeff devotees out there (laughs) If, yes. What would happen if I can't make it? Then you guys yeah, can't no, do the like, show. You are, you are, no, <laughs> there would be no you show. You are the show. This Jim <laughs> is the show. Yeah, It would just be Christina and I talking to each other. Not being recorded. And not being recorded, right? Yeah. Not being recorded. We could just post our transcripts. Uh, just one big text thread. I like this movie. I liked it too. All right. See you next week. <laughs> you so uh, this was a monster size episode. Thank you for sticking till the end with us. Yes. And uh, Have thank fun you. editing this, Jim. Thank you. And thank you for listening. I know it's, you know, a few weeks past Spider Man's release, but thank you for coming back. Well, hopefully, and listening you got a to chance to take. go see it. Yeah. So, no. And Happy New Year again to everybody. 2022. Let's, uh, fingers crossed that it's uh, a good one. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank All you. Right. Hello, everybody. If you liked the podcast you just heard, then please follow TMI on all of our social media outlets. First and foremost, email us at tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. That is tmipodcast2018 
2018 at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at TMI underscore podcast 2018. Step over, say hi, give us a compliment. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram as well, which is also uh, TMI underscore podcast 2018. And of course, we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash TMI podcast 2018. And it should be noted, we also have a community page. So join the forum. And if you like to watch YouTube, you can see us at TMI podcast 2018, all one word. Look for the popcorn bucket. Popcorn bucket. Or you could just go to our website, which has every link there, TMI confessionals podcast.com. And we'll see you at the concession stand. We'll save some popcorn for you. Oh my God. Dad, this is scaring me. Shut up. <laughs>